Here we go. Good morning, everybody. We are live on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram simultaneously taking over the world here. Sex on Sunday with the very lovely Dr. Angela Wright, who is you're a menopause GP. You're a clinical sexologist, a member of the European I can't even Committee remember. of Sexual Medicine. Yeah, sex, sex yeah. therapy trained, sex medicine trained, menopause trained. Brilliant, which is a wonderful combination for all of us because we need to know these kinds of things. <laughs> Now, there's a lot to get through. So when you're dealing with these sorts of things, I mean, at the moment we sort of live in a culture where we're told, well, if you get a bit of testosterone, grab a bit of lube and your sex life will be back to back to normal. Mm. Um, is that a sort of slightly uh, shallow way of looking at it? Are there more things to it than, than testosterone? Yeah, I mean, I, I always start off by saying I'm trained biopsychosocially. So I always think that sex, but it depends on how your body works, how your brain's working and how you are in your relationship and world. So if the only thing that's gone wrong is that your hormone levels have dipped and you need some testosterone, that will work. But for a lot of people, it's a, it's a tipping point at menopause. It's just one of the things that's kind of pushed you from something that was kind of working into something that's definitely not. So sometimes it's way more complex. And in terms of causes of low libido in itself, what are what do you what are the main ones? Is it all hormonal? Is it is it, is it, I mean, I know you just said it isn't, but is it um what do you find? Um, so I find that low libido is a catch-all term. I, I always say to people, we don't do stuff that we don't enjoy or that makes us feel bad about ourselves. So there's a difference between losing your spontaneous desire, that kind of itch that needs scratching or that appetite that's there spontaneously um, and losing that, that sort of wish to have sex itself, which might be about the fact that it hurts or that something bad happens if you try. For a lot of women at menopause, the sensation reduces so that the, the reward and the pleasure gets worse before you even, um, before you get pain. So it, it's a catch-all term and when you dig in and ask the questions you'll often find there's a lot of stuff that's changed about sex which means that you don't want to bother because it's just not as good as it was you mentioned the lack of sensation and uh, <coughs> yeah. excuse me losing my voice here um <clears throat> One of the things, I mean, despite having a degree in anatomy and physiology and spending quite a lot of time chopping up vast amounts of scrotums and penises and absolutely no female genitalia 30, 40 years ago in a, in a lab, um, nobody mentioned to me ever during that or in the 20 years in medical publication that my clitoris was going to shrink. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> are we just not given enough information about why we have this lack of sensation? What's actually going yeah. on? What is it, what's, what's causing it? I think that's, I, I was saying yesterday in a talk yesterday, I feel like Phoebe from Friends giving the truth talk in the bookshop. I, you're, yeah, you're, if we don't tell women that their sexual function is going to change as a result of menopause, then we are just completely ignoring the elephant in the room, which is that we get this reduction in size and sensation from our pleasure tissues. So, so what's going on is some of it is hormone related. So when we lose our estrogens and androgens, and the tissues are full of these things, then they, they change. Um, we lose blood supply to the area, so we get less blood directed into the pelvis. So maintenance of the tissue changes, so it gets less healthy and less able to respond to stimulus, but also the sensation of arousal changes. You don't always feel quite that fullness and that genital kind of congestion that you get when you're in your younger years. And then we're aging. So, you know, we get a lot of other health issues that can rock up, like high blood pressure, diabetes. We end up on medications. Lots of our um, patients at menopause have had cancer or something that's taken them into menopause, which will complicate it. So you're, you're functioning in a different body, in a different mix of hormones and different blood supply. So it feels very different often afterwards. Yeah, you mentioned the high blood pressure there. And this is the thing, you know, we find with men with erectile dysfunction and things like that, is that things that reduce blood supply. Yeah. Um, is, yeah, are we... What what are sorts of things that can can make that better? Because I think they, you know, we're always told this is a phrase I really hate the um the use it or lose it. Use it or lose it, yeah. yeah. One of those women who actually got to the point where I couldn't use it anymore. It, it's it, it almost like it's a portion's blame. It's sort of like well, you know, totally. Yeah, it's yeah, shaming. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is in a way. Um, are there you know are there things that can improve blood supply to the area that that would make that sensation better? Yeah, so the first thing you said about, you know, was, was hypertension. So sometimes if we just choose better drugs, then we can have less of an impact. So just like men with erectile function, if we uh, if we select the drugs carefully so that they don't impact um, the sexual response, then we can improve things. Use it or lose it, I hate. It's not that there's no truth in it, but it, it makes people, and women will have sex with pain anyway. If you look at the stats, women who experience sexual pain, they keep having sex. Women, 60% will fake orgasm, so they'll, we'll pretend that we're having a good time just so that we can kind of maintain, maintain the peace. So 
I don't like telling people to use it or lose it, but if you get blood supply into the tissues, it's like a maintenance cycle. It, it comes in, it gives oxygen to the, the tissues that need to respond to touch and to sexual thoughts and sexual stimulus. So any way of getting blood in helps and getting aroused regularly gets blood in, but that can be on your own. It doesn't need to be in partnered sex. And it's also um, about setting up the body so that the blood can get in as well as possible as well, which means hormones, it means medications, sometimes Sometimes I use um, Viagra-like drugs in the work that I do in low doses. Um, so there's different ways of doing it, but the tissues need good blood supply. Yeah, and it's interesting because you know, a lot of people think that you know Viagra is going to make you horny. It's not. I mean, it actually no, it came from a blood pressure d- drug, didn't it? When they noticed that men had better, um, or what it improved their erectile dysfunction. So yeah. it's not necessarily about making you feel horny. It's about actually no. just getting blood to an area. Yeah, absolutely. You don't get, so men don't get erections if the tissues don't respond. And our tissues are really similar. They they come from the same sort of derivation. So um, we have maintenance cycles, nighttime erections, overnight, in the morning, just like men do, to the clitoris. And that keeps oxygen going into the tissues, which are kept kind of squeezed out. They're kept like a sponge that's that's squeezed out. And you lose them over time with the changes of aging and hormone loss and so on. So what Viagra does, we, we give on a daily basis, low dose, it just helps to encourage blood to get back in to to men's bodies but we can do that sometimes in some women as well okie dokie and estrogen um also helps improve improve blood supply so local estrogen is and and systemic estrogen and systemic should, yeah should make a difference yeah so you get less blood supply to the pelvis after menopause if you don't have hrt but also to other bits of us that we like touching like breasts and nipples and so on so um, women who continue to have hormones will get better blood supply to those areas um, so it's one of the ways that you can kind of improve things definitely local is local's more about um, tissue quality tissue stretch making sure that the blood is working properly that you don't leak um, and, and sort of sensation and, and lubrication but the blood supply going in that's what gives you the wetness when you're aroused and it's what gives you the sensation that kind of tactile pleasure from being touched okie dokie now going back to sort of pretty much where we started was it sort of you know the idea of like testosterone is going to make all of this better um how much of a role does testosterone actually play in in sexual function so testosterone is important. It's it's important in male bodies. It's important in female bodies. It helps us to think and dream and want sex in our brains. And it helps the wiring and the blood supply and the tissues in the sexual parts work better. But it's a bit of a myth, this idea that we suddenly lose it at menopause. It slides off from our younger years. It kind of it gently decreases, bottoms out in our 50s, and then it often rises again a little bit afterwards. So for women who've had their ovaries removed or had them damaged in you know, cancer treatments, radiotherapy, chemo and so on, it's often really important to give, to give some um, testosterone back. For women who are going through a natural menopause in midlife, I often find estrogens more important in the first place. But for some women, it's a game changer, but just not for everyone. It's, it's that what I like to talk about is that it's just not the same for everybody. And if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean you've got no hope. There's a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Um, and speaking then of well, a lot of the other stuff, then I guess you, especially if you've got had cancer and things like that, and you can't have various estrogen type um, treatments, yeah. I'm guessing that the, the Viagra type things are good. What other sorts of things would you suggest for people who, who the testosterone doesn't work for or who can't have hormones? So, I mean, if you look at women who've been through cancer as an example, so for a lot of them, that's a traumatic process, getting that diagnosis. The treatments are unpleasant and uncomfortable. And we learn, we often say that we learn to not feel something by thinking ourselves out of our body. You know, if you have a blood test and someone sticks a needle in the arm, you look over there so you don't feel the full pain of it. And so a lot of women who've had um, unpleasant, frightening, uncomfortable treatments have learned by reflex to come out of their bodies. And one of the biggest things you can do to help them is to get them to do things that bring them back into their bodies and feel that their bodies are safe places again. So that's kind of the mindfulness stuff. That's kind of the thinking stuff rather than the the medical treatments. I mean, often they're on painkillers or antidepressants or other drugs that we use to help them with menopause symptoms, but they can be negative for sexual functions. So sometimes you've got to kind of pick through what they're on. Um, but they're often they feel different in their bodies and their roles have changed in their relationships. You know, they've been cared for for a period and then they kind of come out of that and they feel different. But for other women who can't have um, hormonal treatments, 
it's often about what you don't give them actually what you if you give an antidepressant you can really squash down sexual response so sometimes it's more about what you don't do um, and then teaching people how to really focus in on what's happening in their bodies and really pay attention to it rather than we were all distracted we, we you know we, we would I was on my phone three seconds before we joined up we're always doing about 20 different things simultaneously in sex you need to do one thing which is feel what's happening in your body so it takes practice yeah, that's very true. Um, and thank yes, exactly. Because if you have, apart from people, apart from people who have medical reasons why they're they're, they're not enjoying sex, you're exactly right. We are, you know, that as I say, what we're the sandwich generation where we've got, you know, looking after parents, we've got small kids, we've been working yeah. full time jobs, you know, some of us multiple jobs just to pay bills. Yeah, and you've got the commentary, you know, how many of us have got that commentary in your head that's kind of that's that's judging how it's going. So am I getting wet? Am I responding? Am I gonna climax? What does my body look like? What's happening with my partner? You've got all of that going on. So to actually silence that and just focus in on what you need for your body to work at its best, for you to feel as much pleasure as your body's capable of feeling, that's actual, that's a skill, it takes practice. And we don't do that a lot in our lives. No, very true. And we have this sort of, you know, the mantra now of, of, of many sort of people sort of popping up going, you know, one of the great things about menopause or being post-menopause is that, you know, we know what we want and we can demand what we want in the bedroom yeah. and our sex lives are going to be so much better. But that isn't necessarily the case. I was just doing some CPD, actually, and, and um, there was a sexologist who was saying it's like making a cake. So when you're younger, if sex is a cake, you know, you can have a pile of frosting on top, which is all of your your hormones that are working really well. Your blood supply is working really well. You're full of noradrenaline so that everything kind of fires up in your sexual response. So the quality of the cake underneath matters a lot less because you've got all this frosting. When you hit our point of life, you've actually got a lot less that's going to push this along and make it work really easily. So you've often got to really rethink the recipe in the first place. What you need to hit that sweet spot where everything's going really well is often very, very different from what you needed when you were younger. And, and it was easy for many of for many people. It was a lot easier. Not for everyone. They, they say that if um, the biggest marker of good sex after menopause is good sex before menopause. So a lot of the women that I see, it's a tipping point, but they've actually never really fully enjoyed it or really got what everyone thinks is so good about sex you know so it's uh, we're unpicking that <laughs> the first time I ever asked because you know I come from a um <clears throat> a obviously a very sort of white Anglo-Saxon background with a very middle-class mother and I remember asking him once when I was probably about 12 what's an orgasm and her answer was a waste of time and so that <laughs> <laughs> the beginning and the end of my sex some scripts in that yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, so the world wasn't much point in having these conversations, really. Um, so, yes, we are we are sort of moulded from what we sort of came from behind, from yeah, yeah. Morgan, isn't it? So, if we are getting to that point in, in time where we're just thinking that okay, there's never, you know, it really hasn't. It's been it's been fun, but it hasn't been a hundred percent. Now I've got all of this going on in my life. I don't. I'm you know I'm so tired. I don't have enough energy. Um, it's literally number twenty on my list out of ten of things that have yeah. to be done. Um, how do we start to turn that around? So I do. What do you want to do? I, I think you've got to work to the principle that we do the things we like doing. So you've got to start off by making kind of a, a point of doing things during your week that are probably non-sexual, but that are purely about meeting your needs, finding joy. And actually, that's a kind of mindful practice as well. So I often start with women by saying, you know, unless you've got all of your needs met, it, you are not going to have any part of you that's going to have the energy to do something for someone else. It's got to be something that, you, that you're doing for you because it's something that, that you're going to get some pleasure out of. So um, I get women to focus on little things during the week where they are fully focused on what's happening, whether they're out for a walk or listening to music or eating something, but they slow right down and they start to pay massive attention to the sensory input, the, the pleasure in it. And then over time, and it's different for everybody, you, you build in something that's a little bit more sexually focused and you get some self-focus in there as well, like remapping your body. It might feel different. Different things might be good, bad, indifferent. And you've got to sort of work that out on your own without the pressure of someone else's response to, to worry about. Um, and then you get a little bit better at knowing how to make your body give you some pleasurable feedback. And that's often the starting point of kind of developing the appetite for it again we're often just really disconnected from that yeah yeah that, and it, if you're talking about re, I mean, well, remapping your body I mean well, yeah. apart from the fact that we also probably I can't speak for everybody but speaking for myself you know I've put on a lot of weight things have gone south I don't feel as confident in my skin as yeah. I would have 20 years ago how much of a how much does that play in people's psyche as well 
loads and lots of people come to me and say that they've got no desire and they worry that they're not desirable but actually not they're not recognizing the fact that sometimes the push to come in is because is because their partner desires them you know their partner finds them really attractive regardless much more accepting of that change than we can be ourselves we've got lots of scripts in our society about what constitutes sexy a lot of what we see there was a study that showed uh, over 4,000 um, American films about a 10 year old study and in that only about eight showed women at midlife having any kind of intimate encounter and only five of those was that sexual rather than just a kiss or a hug we are we're not bombarded with images that tell us this is sexy so I think sometimes in ourselves, we have to work on how we find ourselves desirable. I work with women about body scans, um, where we start to think about function and feeling in our bodies rather than just how somebody might see them. Um, sometimes I work intellectually with them and help them to kind of understand the, the commercial things that are driving the messages that we're exposed to, you know, whose voice it is that we're exposed to and maybe challenging that. Um, but often thinking about function and feeling rather than appearance and thinking of ourselves holistically rather than hating our body in little bits which is what women tend to do we tend to dehumanize ourselves you know I want the different arms different arse different boobs you know um so all of that needs work sometimes yeah absolutely um you other things that are important when it comes to to people not wanting sex I guess uh, bladders now I know a lot of women you know they actually sort of say you know you know, I leak when I sneeze. If I'm yeah. going to have sex, then the chances of me not peeing all over the bed are pretty, pretty slim. Um, and so that actually makes them feel like kind of scared about having sex. How do we overcome that? Um, so the, again, body, body, mind, world bits. If you start with body, often there's a lot you can do to improve that. So that's the loss of um, bladder control and leaks and so on is often to, partly due to loss of blood supply, loss of hormones to the area. We To keep those tissues healthy, we need good hormones and, and um, good blood supply. So if someone's able to have HRT systemically, I'd maybe sort, sort that out. If they're not, still local topical HRT, which is safe for almost everybody, still got a good chance of helping. Um, looking at meds and so on, pelvic floor strength, you know, seeing a good gynae physio, if you're having problems with sexuality or leaks, is money well spent if you pay privately. NHS um, have it available too, but it, it really does make a huge difference. Um, so thinking about that, because the overlap, the stuff that causes bladder dysfunction is the stuff that causes sexual dysfunction anyway so you've got to go in there and do the body-based stuff but then a lot of it you know is the practical you can you can empty your bladder before you have intimacy and that does make a difference it will fill a little bit when you get aroused and blood goes in but it's much better to do that you can cut out um the things that stimulate bladders too much like caffeine and alcohol and make sure that you know you're choosing making your choices um and then there's the whole kind of conversation piece around with a partner around um, expectations and sharing fears and talking about that because sometimes that can increase confidence quite a lot um, with people. So it's a whole holistic, as, as ever, a holistic answer. Yeah. the, um, the One of the other things that can put people off and, and is often a very, very sad sort of situation is, is pain with sex, um, yeah. either from atrophy or from, from you know, over-tightening of pelvic floor muscles or God only knows what else. Um, how can people, what, what helps with that? So there's what loads of to understand that it might be painful for you. So what was that question? The last bit you said. How do you get your partner to understand that? It might okay, be yeah. I mean, so the the causes of pain there's loads. You know, the, lots of young women get pain. About a third of young women get pain anyway. And like I said, they tend to keep having sex. So one of the challenges is that we find it hard to feel like less good sexual partners by saying we may have a problem we, we kind of pushed to keep going even though it's difficult so that communication challenge is there all the way along and that I think goes back to the script that kind of you know what makes us valuable we can we sometimes feel it's being able to be a good sexual partner so communication is really important but the causes of um, pain with sex as you get older again often come back to the same same sort of base things that we've talked about already that if the tissues um, aren't exposed to estrogen they get less stretchy they get smaller they they atrophy it is it's genuinely more difficult to tolerate penetrative sex if you don't do something about it perfect floor muscles yet yeah, they can be too tight too lax and you can get nerve pain conditions that give you pain on the outside too and skin conditions so those are stuff that can cause that so you need probably to see somebody to have an examination and to do the body-based bit 
In terms of the conversation, I always encourage people to use I statements. So rather than that kind of you always hurt me when, that's quite that, that invites defense and invites kind of um, a diff different conversation to start off with an I of I find it more comfortable when we do this. I find it it helps me when we do such and such. Just changing the focus of your statement sometimes helps a lot with having good communication around it. Um, and sometimes it's about picking a really good moment. You know, it's picking a time when you're really quite connected in other ways to just gently raise the fact that maybe the reason that you've been having less sex or saying no more often recently is something's changed, but that you're willing to do something to try and work with that. And also, often I often try and encourage people to remember that sex is not just penetrative. It, like it's a whole smorgasbord of different things that are available to us if we can't have penetrative sex for, for many people everything is off the table it's because it, everything might lead there so you don't want to do anything in case it leads to that moment where someone's going to want to to penetrate and it's going to hurt if you have a conversation if you widen everything that counts as intimacy and invite loads of that but just at the moment penetration is something that i'm going to struggle with or i need to get sorted it frees you to continue to have intimacy and connection with your partner without throwing everything off because you don't want to you don't want to have penetration so in loads of households that happens people stop going to bed at the same time they stop going on date nights they you know everything stops because there's a fear it'll be seen as a green light yeah it's it, yeah and it puts an incredible toll on relationships really doesn't it? yeah well if you're if your main way of we talk about love languages and if your main way of expressing your love for your partner is touch based and then your partner is frightened of any touch in case it's seen as a green light for sex that is going to be received as quite a harsh message so so much of it is um supporting communication and Sometimes just naming what you're not going to do for, for now and why takes all the pressure off. And a lot of partners are, are, are relieved that you're still talking about it and still wanting it, actually. They, they may perceive that it's just gone and they don't know why. So the yeah. communication is important. Yeah, it really is. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I know it's not all about me, darling, and for those who have already heard this before, it took me three years nearly to be able to actually have that conversation with my husband yeah. because it's so much about your own personal self and as well as like, you know, yeah. it's everything's gone south you don't have any energy and then you kind of think you know I can't have kids anymore and then you can't even have sex and you sort of think well you know what's the purpose of, of, yeah. of being here it really it takes a lot of unraveling to get to that point when you say a lot of grieving in it as well I think yeah. you, you, it's a lot of loss and I um so sometimes the whole, a lot of sex therapy is about this concept of good enough sex about you know embracing the imperfection of it rather than and in it being a doing thing rather than something that maybe kind of outwardly looks good or, you know, it's much more about the touch, the sensation, the connection, the in emotional intimacy. It's a tilt. And that's back to that cake analogy. You know, you, you, you want to bake something of much higher quality because that you're going to get something from that rather than the bells and whistles on top. But, yeah, I think loads of people, there's a lot of pain in it and a lot of fear um, in it. Yeah. And the other thing, too, I guess, is this is a sort of slightly social political statement, but we tend to have this enormous focus on the fact that sex should be, I know you mentioned different types of intimacy, but basically we're yeah. told that sex is penetrative. And but, the, you know, the bizarre thing is <clears throat> coming back to the question here, the lady who said before, where have my orgasms gone? Um, in, the vast majority of women don't orgasm through vaginal sex. So yeah. how, how, do, how do we get our partners to start paying attention to other areas that are um, <clears throat> more responsive? So this isn't even necessarily their fault. The scripts that we, so scripts are these things that we absorb unconsciously about what sex is. And we learn about what sex is increasingly these days through watching it and seeing it. You know, we see it in pornography, we see it in um, Hollywood films, and we see generally high spontaneity, high passion, penetrative sex between young, attractive, heterosexual couples. And that, straight away, zero for yeah, and an orgasm happens within five minutes, you know, beautiful orgasm, it's all great. So so everyone comes into this with this kind of expectation that this is how female bodies work. When women and men realize in heterosexual relationships that that's not how it works, and sometimes there's a feeling that there's something wrong with you, so the woman will feel broken. But often the male partner feels that something's wrong with their skills but in their skill set. And we get around it, 60% of women get around it by faking, because otherwise what what ends sex? How do we not make our partners feel bad? How do we stop the, you know, the relentless kind of penetrative section if, if no one sort of says, here's the end? So, so often you've been in a relationship where you may not have been being honest about what you need for a long time. So 
again, it's back to that communicative thing of, of using something. So I often say to patients who come to see me, use this consultation, go home and use it as your chance to speak about this is where I'm at. I'm actually going to actively work on this because I really want to get back to some kind of intimacy that works well for me. But to start the conversation, you can do that by buying a book. You can do that by watching, you know, watching this live or whatever. So I watched this thing this morning that's made me think about it. But um, it's about opening up the possibility that you can remap your body, remap your sex life and find something that works now and not having that myth that their bodies are going to be perfect. Male bodies lose touch sensation. Men can't always get back to sex again. They have a longer refractory period. If you're in a same sex relationship, your partner's going to be going through very similar changes as, as you are. All of us are pretty imperfect in terms of our bodies. Eventually, we all end up with some health problems, some drugs, something. Well, this is the thing, especially with men, is you know, well, a you know, apart from us losing clitoral size, you know, their penises do shrink. Yeah, yeah. Testosterone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, this is you know, we you know, if we're tired, we're thinking, oh God, I can be bare, barely be bothered to do this in the first place, and you're going to take twenty minutes longer than the, than you used yeah, to. Yeah. So, um, in terms of getting around that, then understanding that he might be a little bit slower, it might take longer for him to finish. Um, how do we sort of get both sides working quite well together then? So, so you're not thinking, oh my God, this is half an hour of my life that I'm never going to get back. Yeah, I'm never going to get back. So, I mean, there's, I always say there's like three areas. You want to work on the touch that your body needs and your body being as receptive to that touch as pleasurable, not painful. So that's all the body based stuff. That's all the HRT stuff and the medication stuff. But it's also what touch do I like what how much do I need where do I need it it's that kind of stuff as well then it's the psychological what context do I need to be willing to, to do this what kind of a day do I need to have had what kind of emotional support or interaction with my partner do I need to have to not want to stab them rather than kind of you know sleep with them what's all that and also but what's my turn-ons what's my brain got to be doing and thinking to be in the zone and then the final bit of that is you know how do I stay how do I stay present and not distracted and not dissociated your partner actually will have a similar set of needs. You'll have these two Venn diagrams of what you both need um, to, to, to get where you need to go. And you want to work in the overlap. You want to you discuss it and work in the overlap. And sometimes you will be happy to do things that work really well for them, but work less well for you. But that's give and take. You also need that the other way around. And that's a negotiation. But it does, it does involve changing this this definition that the only sex that counts is penis and vagina in a heterosexual couple that actually sometimes spent on oral sex for you may work much better and that might be the way that you need to go and that foreplay is quite central it is the main event yeah the other thing too actually about that I suppose if you're talking about the Venn diagram there is that is timing as well you know men may yeah. feel free for example prefer to do it in the morning whereas I'm probably thinking oh Christ you know you've got stinky overnight you know dog's breath um, I'm not touching you and I you know I may prefer to do it in the evening when I think well I'm going to yeah. get a better night's sleep out of this um, so how do you bridge those sort of you know mismatches of, of timing I think that stuff is a constant negotiation because the idea that we have this one set version of how we enjoy sexuality all the way through a long-term relationship is, is rubbish so it's about opening up the ability to communicate about sexuality in a comfortable way that's like non-judgmental so it is it's always about referencing it against yourself so not that kind of you always pester me the you statement you, you're the problem it's the other way around of I absolutely love sex before I go to sleep I absolutely love sex and you know I remember when this I, I really value this I really enjoy this speaking like that most of us kind of want to get rewards and feel good. So if our partner tells us that we love something they did, we'll rise to that, you know, rather than turning it into you pester me, I don't like, I don't want, which is very different. So, but it changes all the way through. Like sex is a really fluid thing for more fluid for women than men is generally thought, but for both um, genders, it definitely is something that's changeable. So keeping that communication open, realizing how much, um, you don't know about your partner and that's not a bad thing it kind of that fuels the novelty that you need to still find them attractive a lot of the time so allowing them that space to change and letting yourself change too is really important yeah yep lazy gardener over here is saying that she's finding this more and more that there's sort of differences in in wants and times um, yeah. another thing that's really what well, a very very difficult and actually I've seen you know I've seen relationships finish because of this is um changes in odor in the smell of what you're what you would normally smell like in your around your you know yeah. your um i've actually 
seen people who said, I'm breaking up with somebody because I'm so embarrassed by this. And you said, but you can fix this. You can help You can it. totally fix it. It's, it's, yeah, so that's I, relationship because of that. So if people are experiencing a thing, they think, my God, I'm, you know, this, I didn't used to smell like this and now I do. Um, what are some of the things that could be causing that and how can that be overcome? Yeah, when I, when I started doing bits of sort of um, consultancy work, somebody asked me to review an article called my, Why Does My Vagina Smell of Onions, which I thought was like an awful name for an article. But there is that your biome changes, you know. So what happens is the bugs that and we have more biome than ourselves. I think there's like 38 billion other cells on us and 37 billion of us. So we're covered in all these things. Um, and in your fertile years, you've got a mix that is heavy on lactobacilli, which gives you kind of a, um, a slightly acidic uh, vagina and vulval environment. And it's a slightly, it, it's a distinct taste and smell that goes with the vulva that's, that's sort of healthy in that way. As you transition through your menopause and you lose that local estrogen and androgen, um, you get a different set of things living in you and that produces different chemicals and, and, and then you start to smell and taste a bit different. So, you know, I, I'm always a bit mindful of always saying estrogen because of all the women that, that can't or feel that they want to avoid that treatment. But local estrogen helps to reset your biome, which will reset that odor. And almost everybody can have local estrogen. You know, it's, it's really unusual, unless you're having active cancer treatment for hormone um, responsive cancers, that's about the only real contraindication that the mass, vast majority of, of women, even those that have previously had a malignancy, um, can have low dose um, to help to improve that sort of situation if yeah. it's important to them. It's interesting. I had somebody the other day saying that they'd had a meningioma removed and had been told yeah, to estrogen. have estrogen. Yeah. And I, yeah. Like, I mean, surely just a little I mean don't do the loading dose then are there other ways of getting around that you know, maybe yeah it yeah absolutely and and also that the stats show that if you use it all year in the licensed dose the amount that we absorb systemically is absolutely minuscule it's about the equivalent of a single tablet annually in terms of the blood levels that you get so um, and there are different products that have different um, amounts of estrogen in them um, and you can go low and go slow you know when you first start using products if your tissues are really damaged you absorb quite a lot more in the air weeks and you will do once things have healed over so sometimes I, I work um, with women with a slower you know, no loading dose and just go slow you can also use things to massage and um, you know emollients to wash with and emollients to massage with to keep the tissues stretchy and supple help a lot for those that don't want to use estrogens um, I often use something simple like coconut oil or sweet almond oil because it's more sensual more sensory than using you know using um, eczema products but you can you can decide what works for you. Um, but if they're used externally, that's usually fine rather than, you know, um, but you can use anything. But the, the massage, the, the touch on your tissues is what brings blood supply in and it helps to look after the quality of the tissues, the subtlety of the tissues. So that is fine if people don't want to use hormones, it helps. Yeah. If people find that they're, um, I mean, also, I mean, I guess if you do have a really, really foul odor, then it's sort of an indication of a, you know, some sort of You infection. might have an infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just sort of get yourself down there and get yourself che um, checked. Somebody over here is saying coconut oil is great. Um, yeah, that seems to be the, the the oil of the day these days. I remember doing articles a few years back about saying, you know, don't raid your kitchen cupboards to help to help your um, your vaginal symptoms. You know, twelve things you should never stick in your vagina, and. Yeah. Um, coconut oil seems to be coming out a winner across the globe as a recommendation these days it's it's interesting it's relatively I've had people sort of on my um, social media feed question and worry about whether it might you know cause thrush and I think there was a paper once that showed when used internally it can change and cause problems my, my experience working clinically is I've not seen that with women using it on the outside and I've got a colleague working in London who also uses it as a as a baseline and the reasoning for it is if you already feel unsexy, if you're already feeling rubbish about yourself, and then you have to do all of this crap to kind of keep your bits going, it doesn't help. If you can use something that feels like a beauty product that smells nice and tastes nice and doesn't feel like something that you're, that's going to make you feel even less in touch with yourself, that for, for many of my patients is a tipping point. It feels like a nourishing, enjoyable thing to do rather than a, here's my medical smelling eczema cream that I'm applying to my problematic bits that make me feel awful about myself, you know, and that's important. Yeah. In terms of those sorts of things as well, you know, finding good lubes and moisturizers and stuff like that, are there are there any recommendations that you think are important that people should look out for? Because I know, you know there yeah. are people saying, my God, whatever you do, don't touch anything. It's got glycerin in it. But, you know, quite yeah, a lot of people yeah. have an issue with that. So... 
again, it's that sort of once you get um, once you get a bit more vulnerable or delicate and you need to be a bit more careful, you want planar products and you want things that are osmotically balanced so they don't pull fluids out of your tissues and dry you more. I, I make it simple. I don't get any money from yes, but I tend to recommend yes for my um, to all my patients. So I give them what I tend to do is oil based yes on um, the, the vagina of the person I'm treating. And then if there's anything penetrating water based, yes. So the two together, oil and water is called double glide. It's really slippery, doesn't disappear halfway through sex so I, I keep it simple oh that's good as long as the sex doesn't last 30 minutes yeah um, yeah yeah. <laughs> yes um that just made me um forget where I was up to actually um all right here we go we had a couple of questions that came in and one was also about if you are on testosterone um what would be the reasons why you would be showing no no rise if, if it doesn't appear to be working or your level hasn't gone up yeah we have a load to learn and understand about levels in testosterone in, in, in women. So the end of the assay that we use, the low levels that, that we're looking at, the tests that we have in the lab are generally designed to look at the male levels that are kind of, you know, high teens up to top 20s. In women, we're normally down in the bottom half of the 10s, sort of one to two, one to three. Um, so they're less accurate at that level. So the first thing is the levels aren't that accurate in the first place. We, we should be looking more about whether there's any signs of you being over, like greasy skin, um, increased hair growth, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, the second is that there's a lot we don't understand about how people absorb, you know, so how the how the products go through the skin, the different um, skin consistencies, fat layers, blood supply, all of that matters. We don't understand enough about it. So the broad sweep of what we do is we try and give five milligrams a day. We use the, the male products and give a small amount every day. And um, we're mainly doing bloods to track that you're not too high, you know, so that we don't give you too much. Um, and there's no real correlation between your actual testosterone level and how much sexual interest you have. There's no studies that say if it's one, you have this much. And if it's two, you have this much. It doesn't really work like that. So um, and that's part of what I think the problem is when we when we sell or tell people that testosterone is going to give them a solution that's going to give them desire and solve the difficult problem they've got in their relationship um, and it doesn't work we have people really worrying about well why is it not working it's probably because so much more needs to be looked at um, to, to, to resolve things beyond just the testosterone. Yeah, it's an interesting one because remember a couple of weeks ago there was a huge amount of excitement about the um, a clinical trial for a testosterone. That patch. Yeah, which had been tried yeah. in America a few years back and actually well, decades back um, and rejected because it didn't, um, they, I think from memory, it didn't raise the level of sexual approval high enough. It only yeah. resulted in two extra pleasurable sexual encounters a month or something. So yeah. you know, are we actually measuring the wrong things when we're looking? I mean, are the tests you not can... the purpose? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. And also sex is, I'm bang on about it, it's biopsychosocial. Like, you know, so how, when you eat, how often do you eat because you have pure hunger versus the fact that you saw something that looked tasty or someone else was eating something and you suddenly discovered your appetite or you were halfway through something you couldn't be asked to eat. Then you suddenly realized you were starving or, you know, it, it it's an appetite and it is only got a small section of our libido and interest is hormonally driven. There's loads of other cues and, it, and things that, that make us jump in and blocks so many things that are blockers for us. Um, pain, time, privacy, self-esteem, you know, all. so you cannot really properly balance the populations that you're looking at. If you're going to give somebody an intervention that's testosterone and then, then judge it against another set of women that may not have it, there's so many confounding factors that you've got to think about that when you interpret the evidence. I think what's happened, and it's, I think it's brilliant that more women have got access to HRT and access to testosterone. Um, I just think we're oversimplifying um, women's sexuality. We, we, we're trying to sort of being very reductist about it when it's actually incredibly complex and yeah. very individual. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the other question was, after surgery, fear of coming back to having sex after you've had surgery, are there ways of overcoming that? Yeah, start with yourself. So start with a remapping. After any big shift. So I was taught there's four pillars to sexuality. There's your sexual body, which is all of you, like your your saliva to kiss, your joints to move, your, you know, all that kind of stuff. Your sexual function, which is the bits of you that you are, are directly involved in coordinating what touch feels like in your sexual response and so on. Then your sexual identity and your sexual relationship. Every time something significant happens, whether it's giving birth, you know, getting divorced, going through menopause, having cancer, having surgery, 
almost all of those things shift and you have to readjust your footing afterwards to work out who you are and what your sexuality is doing at the moment. So you need to start by remapping against yourself if that's okay with you. So work out how what your body feels like, what feels comfortable, what doesn't feel comfortable, what's pleasurable, what isn't, what touch do you need? Can you tolerate penetration? If so, how deep? If you're scared about the depth of penetration, you might do better being side by side or woman on top when you get back to penetrative sex. So you're in control. You're not giving that over to somebody else. There's O-nuts, little rings you can put on the base of the penis or a toy or whatever's penetrating that help to limit penetration. And that can be really helpful. But start with you. Start with managing how you've changed. So you know that really well. And then you can take it into partner sex with more confidence. And there are little diaphragms as well. I mean, there's sort of little sort of dilators as well, aren't there? You yeah. can start with you know, things that are sort of like the size of a pinky and sort of work back up yeah. and, and sort of gain confidence in, in Absolutely. That. Yeah. yeah, I use the um, Vaguewell and Inspire ones are the ones that I like. They're sort of, um, the, the Inspire are very tapered. I mean, you can, they've got a hole at the bottom that you can put a bullet vibrator through. Pairing it with arousal is really important. That kind of, ex- if you get aroused, you get more blood supply. The, the vagina tense, it opens on the inside. And that helps a lot with space. So working on your own is what we normally do. Start there and then um, and then you can come back to partner sex, get them to use the dilator, uh, trust them to use that first, then move to fingers, then move on to penetrative sex. Yeah. And the interesting thing, too, about that is I think that I think the NHS has some and they're they're plastic and they're awful. (laughs) They're like deodorant cans. I hate them. I never use them. Yeah. And it's about 70 quid to buy your own set. So it's not something that everyone can afford. But again, you know, there are all sorts of um, toys that are available. There's some evidence that toys that vibrate help to improve blood supply and actually help treat vaginismus, that that muscle um, tension that you get when you've got your pelvic muscles just shut sometimes when you've got pain and it complicates things. So a bullet vibrator or I, you know, I I saw the other day with a long sort of skinny stick on the end of it. There's that you can use pebble shaped external vibrators just to get that sort of tissue sensation you don't need to buy things that are definitely dilators that are definitely designed to just get you into penetration you want to work get back to the same basic principle we don't do things we don't like work in a space that is pleasurable and enjoyable work with curiosity rather than a goal focus you don't need to climax pleasure for pleasure's sake is good going for dinner is good even if you don't have pudding every time you know so it's that kind of um opening things up and not being goal focused the whole time helps yeah yep sorry my husband has just decided he'll make a cup of coffee if you can hear oh, him. good on him good on, yeah. <laughs> it's good on him um <laughs> if it's not the dog it's it's him um th- now that actually leads me then to one not the coffee but one of the other things i don't know about your social media feed but mine is absolutely chockers with new home use devices for improving sexual function yeah um, their lead light, home use radio frequency, home yeah, use yeah. laser, all of these things that are going to um, heat internal tissue. And some of them come with, with vibration as well, So, which actually means you think that you probably, if you're enjoying yourself, you're probably not going to take that 43-degree heating tissue yeah, yeah. Thing out of your vagina. Um, what, what, you can obviously gather that I'm not a big fan of these. Um, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I think like even the ones, even the deliberate lasers that are used to improve um, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, we've got some studies that show that they can be helpful, but we don't have good enough papers of good enough volume you know, to, to, to wholeheartedly recommend them yet. So a home device, I think, is a really scary prospect. You know, I wouldn't want to put that near my bits. So I wouldn't recommend putting it near anyone else. Is, is is my view on it but then I'm I'm pretty evidence-based in what I do as much as I possibly can be because I think I think there's a vulnerable we're not even that we're all vulnerable actually in this in this age group it is difficult transitioning through this and in keeping in touch with how you feel about yourself and it is easy to spend money on things that you think might help you to feel better so I I worry about the stuff I see on my social media feed actually we talked about this yesterday I worry about the amount of stuff that's now got a menopause label on it or a you know this is going to help label on it because um I think that that people need access to understanding what we do know and what we don't know so they can make an informed choice. And as far as I'm aware, there is no evidence base that's significant and trustworthy around home devices yet. 
No. And just the amount of damage you could do for yourself is just, yeah. you really don't want to be mucking and around. And then you feel broken. If you do these things and they don't work, then you're going to internalize that. And it's more my body's broken, which doesn't help. We need to be telling people that their bodies generally tend to work pretty well in the right circumstances. They just may not work exactly as they did 10 or 15 years ago. We've got to, we've got to change what we do to make your body work rather than thinking it's, it's knackered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered? Just looking over here at my notes pretty quickly. I mean, I know, I know that I know that it's barely scraping the surface of the topic, but are there, is there anything else of major importance that you think we should um, throw a thought at? No, I think my thing whenever I talk about this is always just to stick it in context of how you feel and how your world's going rather than just suggesting that everything's body based and everything will get better if we just get you the right HRT. I think it's so important to understand the complexity and the individual nature of sexuality. Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to find you, how do they find you? Where are you? Um, so I do NHS work um, and I do private work and voluntary work. So the private and voluntary bit is through Spice Pair Health, which is a clinic of just two of us who are both trained in the same way. So we're both clinical sexologists, both BMS advanced menopause specialists. And we do quite a lot of work online with people for pure menopause stuff, but also um, where sexual function is a problem or after cancer or with trauma. Yeah, there are so few people who are actually trained in this. And we really just don't think about how important this is for, for, for everything, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why we did it online. We thought if we, we were going to open a face-to-face -face clinic, but because there's not many people trained throughout the country, we went online to, to just sort of broaden the access, really. Yeah, absolutely. Why do you think it is that we don't take sexual things seriously enough in society? Why, why is it women sexual health things? Uh, there's a whole site, a whole sort of history behind it. So, you know, the, the clitoris we knew about way before it was included in anatomy books. You know, I think there was a lot of cultural social fear about the idea that women could um, contain manage their own sexual pleasure the speculum when the speculum was invented there was a lot of panic that it would give women sexual pleasure um, so it was it was kind of controversial to introduce a, I mean, no woman who's ever had a speculum anywhere near them would understand why they'd be worried about that but um, so we and most of the medical treatments that I was trained in for sex focus on allowing penetration not on maintaining pleasure so medicine historically hasn't massively concerned itself with sex oh, let alone female mean, sexual though, pleasure. yeah when you look back at those pictures, erections you can see penises yes. you're smashing everywhere yes. yeah yeah, yeah. And I think the penis, if it goes wrong, if you've got a problem with um, arousal, you can see it, it's very visible. Um, but with women, if you didn't get a clitoral erection, you know, you can, not that I'm saying you should, but you can shush and continue to have sex. Um, sex doesn't stop when that happens. So I think that the appetite to, to, to allow women to talk about their experience of what it's like in sex has never really been there. So I do a lot of teaching. It's quite interesting. People want to know now that they know that there's people around who can tell them they want to know, but it's just not being taught routinely in med schools and things. No, not at all. There you go. Well, brilliant. Well, hopefully that will change in the future. Thank you very yeah. much. So people with Spiced Pear Health is the... Yeah, um, that's it. Yeah? Spicedpearhealth.co.uk. Brilliant. All right. I shall finish this up here, finish it up on the um, on the thing. You get a couple of people here saying thank you so very much. Um, pleasure. And I will speak to you soon. Thank you.